Main Street. It's Toronto's original north-south artery, and it demarcates east side from west in much the same way that Fifth Avenue does in respect to Manhattan. It was the trail by which settlers went north in the early years of the 19th century to um, Homestead, and a local boast of press agents is that it is, in fact, the longest street in the world. They arrive at this particular bit of propaganda by virtue of the fact that a young street doesn't exactly end, it just sort of meanders into the Ontario highway system. And it is, in fact, possible to follow this road north and west for about 1,200 miles. If you do, you'll find that most of those miles traverse country that is absolutely haunting in its bleakness and emptiness and starkly magnificent beauty. Uh, but this, alas, is not one of those miles. It's a little bit of Young Street called The Strip. I'm not sure who gave it that name or whether he was aware of the Duke Longtemps involved. Civil libertarians, of course, find the strip an absolutely irresistible cause. Most of us are content to simply find it an embarrassment. But it is very visible evidence of the grotesque distortions for which the idea of the city, well, any city, is um, so often responsible. By the time I was six, I'd already made an important discovery that I get along much better with animals than with humans. When I was 12, I began to sketch the libretto for an opera, which would declare my affinity in no uncertain terms. It was going to be about the self-destruction of the human race. It involved the takeover of the planet by species of morally enlightened frogs, fish, and associated reptiles. What I had in mind, I think, was a sort of, um, well, if the ghost of Richard Strauss will pardon the pun, a sort of aquatic toad for clown. Sorry about that. If there was, however, to be one human character on stage, the part was conceived for a boy soprano, and I'll give you one guess as to who is to get it. Anyway, the opera did not get finished, didn't even get produced, which was perhaps just as well, because the casting problems would probably have been insuperable. Some years later, I was taking a walk along a country road one evening, and as I passed a field in which about three or four dozen cows were grazing, I happened to be singing to myself a song by Mahler. Oddly enough, it was the song called St. Anthony's Sermon to the Fishes. And as I walked along, I glanced at the cows, and I noticed that they, in turn, were glancing at me. So I stepped up the volume just a bit, and with that, the entire herd converged on the nearest fence. And it was an extraordinarily touching occasion. I really felt that a very special bond had been established. Certainly, I've never encountered so attentive an audience before. In any event, I have no idea whether such repertoire has any appeal for elephants, but I am here to find out. So, <clears throat> see. Antonia Surpredi. They tell me, I have never done it, and I certainly do not plan to do it now, that it is possible to walk through the city following a network of ravines and river valleys like this one without ever once setting foot to concrete. 
And somehow or other, though I don't plan to do it, I do find that a rather impressive statistic. Uh, this particular ravine is called the Don. It's locally known as the Muddy Don. And apparently, if I am in marathon training, which I'm not, it would be possible to go that away for about five miles, in which case I'd empty into Toronto Harbor along with the rest of the refuse in the Don. And uh, in the other direction, I could go about nine miles. And again, as I said, never once set foot on a pavement. And that is kind of interesting. There are two notions, I think, which uh, grew up in the sense in the 60s in North America and played a very important role in the development of Toronto. One, obviously, was our sudden concern for the care and feeding of the environment. That sort of thing was all very old hat to European city planners. But it's quite novel here because the North American tradition, of course, has always been one of extreme pragmatism as regards the design of the city. And uh, this kind of literal trailblazing in the middle of the city would have been unthinkable two or three generations ago, certainly, maybe even one generation ago. The other notion, which seems a very different on the surface, but is, I think, very compatible and very, very important, is the idea of technology as the master of the environment. Technology is, in large measure, responsible for the fact that, despite my distaste for all cities, I continue to live in this one. For me, the idea that technology does provide an alternate environment, that it can transcend the tooth and claw survival of the fittest laws of nature, is a very comforting concept. I've never understood why some people find it so threatening, and its ability to make the necessity of musical performance in a public arena absolutely irrelevant has literally changed my life.